Well, welcome everybody. It's good to see you tonight. Um, my name is Peter Reynolds. I'm chair of the Root Climate Action Group. And uh, we have quite a full evening planned here tonight. Um, this is part of a forum process we've been doing over the last number of days uh, on climate change. And it's part of the Resilience Montana project from the University of Montana. Day was organized this way. It was from 10 to 2. We first had a science talk by Dr. Bruce Maxwell of MSU, who's a soil scientist and has worked on climate change in Montana uh, in various ways for over a decade. And then we broke into six facilitated breakout groups of about uh, 10 or 12 people each uh, and, and really worked uh, that group in terms of what they saw uh, uh, in terms of um, following up on uh, Dr. Maxwell's talk. And then we had a panel discussion. And so that's what happened. And I'm going to, to the best of my ability here, walk you through uh, some of the findings from that day. So uh, let's start with Bruce Maxwell's presentation. Um, uh, here are some of the assumptions from the data that we're going to look at. He drew data from uh, weather uh, stations up and down the valley, and he used four-month seasons, June to September, December to March, because he feels that's kind of how you can look at more at trends in this valley. Uh, he was looking for statistically significant data with a 90% uh, confidence level. And it was based on an RCP of eight and a half, which is not much mitigation of causes of climate change. So that's kind of what we're looking at, unless you know there's a lot more uh, effort made internationally on the on the issue. That's my understanding of it. So um, given that, then uh, Dr. Maxwell talked about these areas, seasonal temperatures, uh, precipitation changes and heat, wildfire risks, air quality, uh, and air quality. So uh, first, let's talk about seasonal temperatures. In the summer, can you guys see OK over there? I've got to stay in this box. <laughs> uh, uh, in the summer, we're looking at significant temperature increases out to the end of the century. Um, by 2038, projected increase of 12.2 more days over 95 degrees. More days over 95 degrees than in 2010. Um, also, nighttime minimum temperatures on the rise, um, which is a very significant development uh, because it means uh, impacts to human health. The hotter it is, the more difficult it is to get a good night's sleep, and that has many different effects on human beings, but also on uh, livestock and animals. They're not able to put on weight. Um, and it certainly stresses the wildlife. So um, the nighttime minimum temperatures on the rise are uh, a, a major concern. In the winter, we're also seeing increases of both minimum and maximum daily temperatures. Um, and the number of hard frost dates is decreasing. Warmer winters mean increased attacks of pests like the pine beetle, which we've seen so much of, increased annual weeds, uh, and then uh, it, it means we have to change how we're farming and ranching to some extent, especially around the choice of seed and crops because of the change in pollination and when things mature. Uh, now moving to the precipitation changes, though. Um, 
even though the models predict about the same amount of moisture going into the future, much more of it will be as rain and less as snow. Um, this has a number of major uh, impacts. One, a faster runoff in the spring. Um, and the, the, the snow that we receive in the spring usually does not last because um, rain soon follows on it and it uh, melts much more quickly when it's rained on. Uh, this means a shorter skiing season and a shorter fishing season. Uh, continuing with precipitation changes, warmer winters also mean less early winter snow stored as ice. This was something I was not familiar of. The earliest snow in the winter tends to turn to ice and be more long lasting. And of course, is a source of very cold water in the spring and summer. If we get less early snow, less ice, warmer uh, rivers, warmer rivers and streams due to the lack of runoff from that ice. And uh, this also leads to a lower river and stream flow in July and August when we tend to need it most or trying to get through the rest of the irrigation season. If anybody has questions along the way, just put up your hand, but I'm going to cruise along with this. Robin? Can I just make a comment? I, also, you're talking about changes that are <coughs> going to happen, but I thought Bruce said that these changes are already happening since 1980 to 2020. We've already seen these things going on. Yes, they're going on, and, yeah. and, uh, and then he talked about the projections into the future being just marching right along. Yeah, but thanks for that clarification. This is based on the historical data, data from 1980 to present. So moving into drought then, um, these uh, changes in the stream flow runoff combined with the higher summer temperatures means the transpiration and moisture loss in soils and plants is, is uh, in, in especially significant, especially in July and August. And so uh, this is a comment I heard him make uh, uh, before the forum that keeping the irrigation systems flowing like the big ditch through the summer is going to be increasingly difficult. And then uh, wind is something he touched on. Um, surprisingly, the data from 1950 on into the future indicates somewhat of a decline in overall wind speeds, uh, which you wouldn't think necessarily. We've seen some incredible wind events up at our place in the last couple of years, but one of our panelists noticed that, uh, noted that historic data does not really capture a tremendous wind event that happens to happen on a single day. Uh, it just is lost in the data. Um, we'll come back to this point uh, a little later on. So, um, and then finally, moving to wildfire risk, uh, the number of high fire risk days is continuing to increase, and by 2038, 11% projected increase in the number of high probability days for wildfire. So, wildfire risk. Um, on its way up. So uh, looking to health impacts now, uh, air quality in Red Valley County uh, I know is something we all know about, uh, but one point that he brought is that the sources of that air pollution here is way more than wildfire smoke. Gravel pits, road dust, ditch burning, and wood stoves are up among the things contributing to our poor air quality. And then when you add wildfire smoke to that, uh, that's how we got a grade F from the American Lung Association in recent years. We have some of the worst air quality in the country here. And um, 
Uh, one thing that was mentioned is this Air Now app from the EPA. If you don't know about it, you can put it on your phone and know uh, what the air quality is at any time, day or night. <clears throat> so um, that was pretty much uh, his comments, although he said a couple of things more on the panel. I'm going to move to the comments from the panel now. And we had uh, Charlie Harris from Trout Unlimited was one of our pa panelists, and he threw out some things he hadn't heard. First of all, uh, these altered stream flows is in cre creating additional sedimentation, causing a de decrease in insect uh, populations. And that that, in turn, leads to a good decline in bird populations. And uh, it also introduces invasive species into the river. This is all stuff he's seeing as a fly fisherman. He also has quite a bit of medical background and is a keen observer, I, 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 I believe, of his environment. And these are things he added that he thought were needed. Um, more education and the kind of programs Trout Unlimited is doing right now where they have uh, tanks in the classroom where the classes raise trout and then they release them in the river in the spring and then uh, they're initiating a, a bug collection and monitoring program. They're really trying to turn out some young scientists um, in, the, in the schools and um, you know this helps everybody learn about what's actually happening. The other thing that's needed is reconnecting streams uh, to the valley. And uh, this is a complex area I'll touch on again in a minute, but Trout Unlimited and the Bitterroot Water Partnership are working on these things now, um, trying to get better regulation of our irrigation systems. So, um, and then um, Eric Hoover, who's here in the audience uh, from the Sheriff's Office, threw out a couple of points about um, the emergency response around climate change, and he mentioned uh, the hazard mitigation um, around enhancing dams and sustainability of our infrastructure to deal with uh, these kinds of climate events. And he also mentioned individual preparedness, uh, helping people understand what they can do in terms of lawn watering and that sort of thing. Um, uh, these are more comments from uh, Bruce Maxwell, who was on the panel uh, around water. Many drain drainages are over allocated already, even though uh, the drainage we were on was just re adjudicated a couple of years ago. Um, there's just more demands on that water than ever. Uh, so we need to be saying to regulatory agencies, we need you to regulate the water such that we have clean water to drink, that there's agricultural use, and that it continues to support a healthy ecosystem. So that's something we need to do. Um, and these seemingly competing interests need to be balanced, he said, by listening to stakeholders. Uh, another comment from the panel, the population here is growing. That is a, a pressure in the midst of all these things we're talking about. The city and county need to begin to address this front and center. Um, wildfire smoke, uh, uh, the, the health detriment of that is really, we're seeing a lot more about it in just the last couple of years. It's really bad for you and especially for older people or our young, uh, young people, infants and children, uh, because of the size of their lungs and the amount of air they breathe are really susceptible to wildfire smoke. And the minute size of these particulates just go right through the uh, barrier, the, the blood and uh, membrane barrier in the lungs. So we're going to be having to address this as a community uh, more and more. 
Uh, nighttime temperatures increase. It was also pointed out, make wildfires burn hotter. Used to be the nighttime was the time the fire got a rest and the fire crews got a rest and things kind of settled down for a while. But these, in this new era, it's not happening that way. And then wind, again, was mentioned. Uh, the Roaring Line Fire had a 50 mile an hour wind behind it, so it was just like a blowtorch coming down the valley. Um, just about any mitigation you do is, is uh, useless in the face of something like that. So, uh, and then uh, in response to a, a question on thinning the forest, and we have some major thinning projects uh, on the table for both the east and west side of the valley, uh, these points were made. Um, uh, quoting a, a, a study, a recent study in Canada, found that cool, moist years, the density of fuels in the forest is a factor in wildfire spread. So reducing that density helps when uh, temperatures are cool and moist. But in hot, dry, windy years, the density of the fuels seems to make little difference. Also, um, the compacted soils resulting from um, fire severity um, uh, uh, have a, an impact. Uh, and the new trees, if we cut trees and replace them, take 30 years to become a carbon sink. So whenever we cut a tree, we lose not only the carbon stored in it back into the atmosphere, but it's actually a factory removing carbon from the atmosphere. So um, that um, produced um, um, uh, some response from the audience. And because it was pretty important points made, I included that here on forest thinning. Uh, heavy forest fuels can re result in localized fires, severe localized fires, and occurrence of hydrophobic soils, which apparently is soil that won't take water well after a super hot fire. And that impacts regeneration and erosion. Um, the U.S. Forest Service policy does include thinning as a risk reduction strategy. And on the Bitterroot National Forest, uh, adaptive response includes removing mature dug fir trees and replacing with more fire and heat tolerant ponderosa pine in open plantations. So, to ma uh, and this point was made, to maintain that fire risk reduction after thinning requires an ongoing monitoring and management process to prevent regrowth and then drying out and, and becoming hazardous. But generally, that monitoring and management is not funded, so it doesn't happen. So that's, that's um, kind of the panel and uh, Dr. Maxwell's presentation. Now I'm going to give you a bit from the, the groups themselves. And if there was any word that was used more than any other, it was water. All the groups had a lot to say about water. And a lot of other things, too. But water was certainly um, on everybody's hearts and minds that day. So I'm going to give you some key takeaways from the breakout groups, and starting with the impacts on our valley of climate change. This is what the groups were saying. First of all, the stream flow changes that I've talked quite a bit about here. Um, all of that taken together is uh, a big, big change from what we knew here 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Some of us have been here a long time. And we've seen these changes. And um, these changes are going to impact our irrigation, going to impact our recreation, going to impact our aquifer, uh, it will impact our ecosystem, and then our own use of water as in for drinking or whatever we use it for at home, taking a shower, all that has to somehow be rebalanced uh, and understood as a community issue. 
Another impact that's really going to hit us is the decrease in snow precipitation. And I talk quite a bit about that. It's a, uh, it's going to make a big change. It has made a big change already. Um, less predictable weather and smoke season. Right now we're sitting at the middle of October, no frost. Uh, we used to wait to pick our apples till we got a good frost on them. They were just falling off the tree, so we, we picked them. But uh, it's uh, going to be, who knows, you know, in the southern hemisphere, in the winter just completed, they hardly had winter. It was extremely hot down there. So I'm curious what kind of winter we're going to have. Um, loss of biodiversity. And uh, we should add uh, increase in invasive species. Um, we've talked, uh, we talked a lot in the forum about the trout and the other fish that, are, that can't live in the water that's this warm. They're, they're getting tumors. They're getting all sorts of um, anomalies. Um, uh, having an impact on the uh, insect hatches. And then meanwhile, up at our place, we see hatches of all kinds of things we've never seen before. Praying mantis, we saw the other. Never seen a praying mantis in our garden. Isn't that weird? And uh, chipmunks now up on the, on the east side. Uh, just wild. A lot of changes happening in the... Uh, animal world, plant and animal world. Another impact, air quality. Um, it's just going to get smokier and hotter. Um, and uh, it's one reason why a Bitterroot Climate Action Group has a program to hand out uh, HEPA filter uh, units to people who are vulnerable. And then food security. Um, uh, supporting the local food system and the hardworking folks who are growing food is probably a really good idea since we don't know what's going to happen to the food system surrounding us in the country and in Mexico and other places. So, okay, uh, more takeaways from the breakout groups. Here are some mitigation and adaptation strategies that were mentioned. We need to get into education. We need to work in the schools. We need to talk to our elected officials. Uh, uh, every, everybody needs to learn about the stuff I'm talking about here. And we need to be, everyone here, talking to your family and the friends and groups you're connected with about the kind of issues I'm talking about here so we can uh, get a consensus about um, what a good education includes <laughs> around uh, climate. So uh, this can include resilience resources to homeowners, renters, and agriculturists. And I'm sure that BCAG will be uh, looking at some of this in the coming year. Um, we need comprehensive planning around these issues, some kind of a cross-agency action committee or interagency group um, where we're starting to coordinate and uh, understand across different responsibility areas how to um, uh, address these situations like water that, for instance, that require multilateral action. We need communication on water management specifically because that is so crucial to everything we do here in this valley. You know, when Lewis and Clark came through here, they wrote in their journal that it was one of the most desolate places they'd ever seen because the hillsides were all brown and rabbit brush and the bottom of the valley was impenetrable uh, forest. So. Uh, that's what it'll go back to <laughs> without human beings. We've made it very different here. And it's all because of irrigation water. We need to remember that. 
uh, energy efficiency and increased renewables. Um, you know, we're moving toward an all electric society. We need to really get aggressive about um, targets for climate neut uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, Missoula County is way, way ahead of us on this, but we can be having those conversations with our elected officials uh, about um, purchasing and uh, built facilities within the city and the county um, and our local business community through the chamber. Um, in fact, um, uh, um, uh, Dan Bramberg, who was here uh, at the panel, panel uh, forum said that uh, for farmers, up to 71% of the cost of implementing renewal, renewables can be covered by various programs. There's a tremendous amount coming through the Inflation Reduction Act. So we need to be taking advantage of all that in our community. Uh, supporting the local economy. Um, uh, as we're working toward uh, mitigation of climate change seems to be something we can do that would strengthen everybody. Uh, and then reforestation and agroforestry, um, and I would say agriculture in general. Uh, agriculture and the growing of food, its transportation, its consumption, and eventually ending up in the, in the waste heap is almost a third of our climate footprint in the United States. It's a huge deal. And a huge amount can be done by a farmer, for instance, who wants to um, work with his fields to keep uh, carbon in the ground, you know, to store it. The soil can be a sink for carbon. So these are things that we can be uh, exploring here, maybe through a special uh, interest uh, group another thing that BCAG is looking at. And then increase the beaver population was mentioned. Why not? Uh, though they're the bane of irrigators, if you ask uh, any of the old timers around here. And then finally, uh, who needs to be involved and engaged to make these things happen? Well, obviously our elected officials, our governmental agencies, our local businesses, our educators at the, uh, uh, in the local schools and in our uh, universities that are resources to us, nonprofits uh, across the board and really everyone. So um, that's what happened Friday. That's what we talked about. I hope that gives you a, a flavor of it. And um, I want to thank everybody that helped put that day together, uh, and especially uh, Robin and his team. We had wonderful support from the university with facilitators and so forth, and then our own Cheyenne Burroughs, who was the coordinator. So I want to take some questions then. Um, yes? Right, um, absolutely. She's saying the home ignition zone around the home, that five feet initially close in is super important to keep uh, non-flammable. And then the next zone out about 30 feet, um, different steps there and then further out from that. So um, that, thanks for bringing that point. What else was left out here? Just Yell it out. Jill? For the local food system, our group uh, said we need more uh, meat packing uh, companies so we can have some of our meat scraps in more of the process in the valley to do the local food system. Right. More local reliance all around is good. Frank. Yeah, you brought up 
zoning and, and, and land use regulations, which is a real cuss word in Rivala County, of course, but uh, that people uh, don't have boundaries when it comes to how their land is used often. And so land use and zoning as part of the regulations that need to be involved with the climate and regulating Absolutely, yes. Um, Laura Jackson and I had an interesting conversation last night at the high school family science night with a, a builder who was talking about how the insurance companies are really starting to crack down on building in the urban wildland interface. And that um, more and more going into the future, it's going to be the insurance companies and the realtors kind of having to get their uh, get on the same page about some of this because it just can't be paid for. Kirsten. Um, the other, one thing that we talked about in our group that we didn't really talk about uh, to the larger group was about electric vehicles and the double-edged sword of electric vehicles and uh, the Sheep Creek Mine project that's going up at the headwaters of the West Fork. And that um, although it's, there's this enormous push to get there, um, there's a lot of consequences, especially to communities like ours, where we have a relatively small population. And uh, as far as making a big stink about it and having a big voice and trying to prevent that from happening is uh, critical to all these things that we're talking about. <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that we learned out of the last presentation that I went to at Chapter 1 with Philip Ramsey about this was that um, they had uh, they've been doing presentations for months, but they discovered most recently that um, the mineral, what, uh, what the, the, the water at the Berkeley pit, I'm sorry, the Berkeley pit in Butte actually contains some of the rare earth minerals that are they're talking about extracting up here, and that in the course of extracting those minerals out of the Berkeley pit would actually clean the water at the same time. And, um, and this was new information that they had not had previously. So, so there's, there are things that are relevant to these changes that we want to have and what the consequences are to small communities and pristine uh, ecosystems but then there are solutions that we can start exploring that um, we want to try to not just complain about something happening, but also be able to talk about a solution. Right. Th thanks for that. There's some really tough decisions to be made, and, and Bitterroot Climate Action Group doesn't know what the answer is to what you're pointing out. Yeah. But we've got to figure it out.